<laughs> well, good afternoon. I understand through Brian that uh, there were some questions following the cabinet meeting this morning that the press had, and rather than trying to do them one at a time, we just thought we'd make ourselves available to you as a group. Maybe some opening comments. Um, we're taking a number of steps to advance the budget balancing process that needs to get done after the uh, legislature concluded their work uh, recently. Uh, as you know, they were here for five months. The Minnesota legislature was here for five months. The job wasn't completed by Minnesota law and constitution. The budget needs to be balanced. And so now we're about the business of bringing the budget into balance. And there's going to be a number of steps associated with that, fulfilling that responsibility. As we mentioned the other day, we want to make this process as thoughtful and thorough and uh, complete as possible. So we're taking a number of steps. They include having a special cabinet meeting this morning to discuss uh, the challenge and the responsibility that lies ahead of our administration with all of our cabinet uh, members. Uh, that was a good discussion. It was basically just an overview of, of the situation and the steps that we'll likely be taking in the coming weeks and months and asking for their uh, help and input. Today we're also sending a letter to every legislator asking them if they have any ideas or suggestions or concerns about the budget balancing process to let us know as soon as possible, but ideally by next Friday. Uh, each legislator or committee chair has uh, you know, experience and insight into these issues. We want to make sure we take into account their perspective and their input. And so we hope that we'll get some good ideas from them and that they'll participate uh, in that process. Uh, we also will be taking a similar process both by letter and meetings and other communications with key stakeholder groups who we know will be interested in uh, areas of budget impact like local government officials, uh, advocates and uh, representatives from the healthcare industry, a variety of other groups uh, and perspectives like that. So we'll take that into consideration as well. And then of course we'll uh, continue the process of communicating with the press as this unfolds as well. And we continue to invite the public for their input. Uh, and Brian, give out the website again. It's uh, government uh, budget ideas. The budget ideas at state.mn.us. Budget ideas at state.mn.us. Uh, the challenge that's before us uh, is one that relates to balancing the budget through reduction. So it would be most helpful if uh, people can uh, stay focused on that and their comments, and that would be most useful and, and helpful to uh, what we need to do. And just by way of concluding thought, this isn't the process I would have chosen or would have preferred, but it is the process uh, that we now have to use or now will use uh, to get this budget balanced. It's important that we have a balanced budget in Minnesota. The legislative process didn't get it done, but it needs to get done. And so the responsibility now falls uh, to me and my administration, and it's one that we'd prefer not to have to do, but we have an obligation and responsibility to do. So with that, you may have some questions or uh, points of inquiry. We'll be happy to take them. No, Martika, we really, uh, you know, haven't zoomed in on that level of detail. We've looked, you know, we obviously have identified broad categories, as you know, that we'll be looking at. But we also are going to be looking at the whole budget, you know. And so the conditions exist, uh, Commissioner Hanson believes, and I believe, for this budget balancing process. But we want it to be a comprehensive process and a thoughtful process uh, and, a, and one that we take you know, in a deliberative fashion. But uh, we want to make sure that it's not just limited to one or two categories. We're going to look at the whole budget. And even if some of the areas are smaller, they may be worth looking at. And what are the marginal representative cabinet members going back to their budgets, going through them? And are some more important uh, than others because they're bigger? Well, first, uh, Pat, there's a number of steps that have to be taken. And, and of course, this builds on the deliberations from earlier. But Commissioner Hansen will you know, set out the analysis about how the revenues don't meet the need and the other requirements of the statute, and there's a process involved with that, going to the LAC and other things. So there's just a set of procedures and analysis that have to be followed and developed, and, and that will be done. Uh, as of today, we haven't given the cabinet any specific marching orders other than to kind of outline the process and what's likely to happen. We'll be coming to them with a specific set of inquiries or asks in the coming days and weeks. But uh, we didn't go to a particular department and say, you know, you need to give X percent or you need to do a Y. We just asked them for their ideas. Is there a schedule then before July 1st when the fiscal year begins? That is, um, you have to spend down the reserve. Uh, I'm asking if you have to spend yeah. down the reserve. If there are certain time constraints that you have. 
before this budget balancing authority kicks in, uh, it assumes that the reserve has been spent down. In this case, it has. It, you know, there isn't a reserve currently, so that's, that criteria seems to have already been met. So July 1 is the hard deadline? July 1 is the start of the biennium, Tom, and so, um, you know, as a technical matter, these unallotments uh, would apply or balance budget tax would apply beginning then, but there's a bunch of preparation work that we can do in anticipation of that date. And, you know, they all don't have to be done at the same instant. There may be that they unfold over a period of time. In fact, some of them will likely um, apply to the second year of the two-year budget cycle. And so there will be a legislative session in between now and then where the legislature could make some adjustments or take an alternative approach. One could anticipate. Is that intentional to make sure if you're going to signal to the legislature, if you want this health program, you should spend health care access money, or if you want this, you should? Well, to the extent possible, Tom, we'll try to focus on those second year uh, appropriations or allotments because that will give the legislature some time to review what we've done, have a chance to alter it if they like in conjunction with us. That's not going to be possible in all of the areas. It's just not because of the way the money gets paid and how it gets paid. But to the extent, uh, fullest extent possible, we're going to try to emphasize the second year um, for that reason. Well, we, our, our goal is to try to maintain funding for K-12 education and some other key priorities. You've heard me talk before, Martiga, going into the session. We had some areas that we wanted to insulate or protect from any reductions. Those included uh, veterans programming, uh, military programming, uh, programs that relate to either veterans or families of the military. Uh, and we were able to do that during this legislative session. In fact, if you look in the Egg and Vets bill, that kind of funding was actually increased, which is a good, by, in my view. Other areas that were a key priority for us were public safety, state public safety programs. Uh, we signed a compromise bill, as you know, that wasn't all our way, it wasn't all their way, but it was a compromise bill. We also want to try to protect to the fullest extent possible K-12. Um, we are going to have to defer some of their payments, and we think we can do that in an approach that will mimic the effects of the shift, of the DFL uh, shift that was proposed. We also proposed one, but somewhere, uh, some combination of those two. Um, but we don't view that as a, you know, a net reduction in funding. We think it will have the effect of deferred payments. Are there areas of the budget where you, there's questions whether you actually have the authority that you're asking or the cabinet members are asking? That is a health care access, <coughs> the shifts, for example, uh, from one year to another. Are there some areas where you, you are not sure yet? No, Pat, in, in the case of the health care access fund, I can only uh, take action in terms of balancing the budget in funds that are in deficit. So the health care access fund is actually in surplus and is projected to be in surplus uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. So I, I don't have the ability to you know, take money out of the health care access fund because it's not in deficit. Um, what was the other part of your question? Yeah, we think we can. Yeah, we we think we can effectuate the same effects as the shift. It may not be exactly done the same way, but through a variety of mechanisms, we think we can achieve the same impact. We have yeah. Minnesota mayors are fanning out around the state, I guess, in the next couple of days to uh, voice their concerns. Uh, will you, if the mayors come to you and with some kind of uh, plea, will you listen to them and? Could you talk about that specifically, that part of the budget specifically? Or how sensitive are you going to be to their needs? Sure. My uh, question, I guess, to the mayors, and we'll, they were very helpful last time we did this because they gave us some suggestions about how to structure it. And we have the ability within broad categories to put some limitations on the budget balancing decisions that we make. So, for example, in the local government aid area in the past, we said we will uh, immunize or hold harmless the cities under 1,000 or 2,000 in population. We can put some other you know, broad parameters. We can't uh, target a particular city one way or the other, but if it's within a broad classification, we can make some adjustments to at least soften the impact of it, Eric. Um, you know, the question I'm going to have for mayors and local units of government is what percent of reduction can you take as the total revenues? And the answer can't be they're not going to take any cuts because everybody else is. You know, all, people all across Minnesota in their family lives, in their business lives, in their employment lives, are taking either flat revenues or, in many cases, reductions compared to a year or two ago. So I do not want to hear from mayors and city council members that they can't take any reduction at all. And so what percent of their total revenues are they willing to uh, pare back in the light of the worst economic recession in 60 years? And the answer better not be zero. 
The answer better be something uh, you know, short of zero. Uh, if it's not 5%, is it 3%, 4%, what is it? And again, you've heard me talk about this before, but some other questions are, first of all, many of these cities, not all, have rainy day funds. You know, if you've got rainy day funds, use them. It's rainy. Uh, number two, uh, they all have property tax levies that go up every year. Well, we tried to cap those, but where's that money going? To the extent they're increasing levies, how are they using it? Number three, have you frozen the salaries like we have at the state level at, and for your city, for your county, for your school districts? People across Minnesota should insist and demand that school districts, counties, and cities freeze their salaries for their employees for the next two years. That will take a lot of the financial pressure off uh, cities and counties and school districts. And then also, what have they done to streamline operations to downsize to make it more efficient and the like? And again, each city is different because of size and circumstance. But as a general proposition, uh, they cannot make the argument in the face of everybody else tightening their belts. Families are tightening their belts. Businesses are tightening their belts. Churches are tightening their belts. Charities are tightening their belts. And to have cities come forward and say, we can't take any cut at all is hogwash. It's hogwash, and they need to get their head into the reality of these times, which is we got a recession, which is the worst in 60 years, and instead of just whining and complaining, they need to figure out how they can reduce their spending by a few percent. I don't think that's unreasonable. What do you think small cities will be protected again? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the email address, you know, Brian can make some of those available. I haven't uh, had a chance to go through them yet, but we will. Well, we typically constituent email oh, yeah, yeah. that we do not share because anything that comes to the government from a constituent is not it's private. Yeah, yeah, we can get you out. Individual. I mean, that individual, I mean, that person, the individuals can share information. So that's the policy that we've always had because we get tens of thousands of emails. Can you put something on there that says if you send something to here? Uh, but we, we can violate their data rights, but what we can do is summarize the ideas that we got, the categories of ideas that we got. I'm sorry. I was just asking, you have any general ideas for people passing what I'll be doing there? We can get, develop that for you, Nathan. We can develop that for you. We just don't have it right at the moment. Governor, you talked about uh, reaching out to individual legislators, uh, stakeholders, and the media. And what about uh, the VFL leadership? What, what do you have? No, we welcome their input. You know, they, we just went through a five-month process where all of their arguments were made, all the hearings were held, all the witnesses were called, all the bills were considered, and so there's been five months worth of debate, input, process. In fact, even to the waning, waning hours of the session, they had their uh, legislative commission on, you know, whatever it was, uh, taking testimony. We observed all of that, absorbed all of that, and so there's been a process, and now the time has come to make some decisions and to lead, and unfortunately the legislative process couldn't yield that, but we can, and we're going to. So what, what would you say to someone that would look at that and say that uh, that might come across as an end around move around the Vietnam area? Well, we don't tend to end around them. We've invited them uh, as in anticipation of this when they were here at the closing hours of the session, that if we got to this point, they're invited to provide their input, their suggestions. I think they welcome that opportunity. Again, whether it's the leadership or committee chairs or individual legislators, their input is welcome. And in the past, it's been helpful. As you know, they are questioning your authority to do this. I'm wondering uh, what, what would future governors do? They, they argue that this would be a precedent. That if you go through with this, the next governor or any governor could never deal with the legislature. You could just not sign any bills or could do exactly well, one of the reasons that this is happening this way, Pat, is because they um, you know, processed the legislative session in a way that allowed it. Uh, this is this has happened not happened before because prior legislative leaders, you know, uh, managed the situation a little better. I feel like you're trying to say something. No, I'm not. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, this is not the path I would have chosen, but it's the path we're on, and so we've got to move forward. And and if you look at the statute, it, it was designed for circumstances where, you know, the revenues and the need are mismatched, and we've got to bring the budget into balance. This is not a joke. It's not some, you know, contest. It's a question of constitutional importance and magnitude. The legislature had five months to get it done. They didn't. People of Minnesota are sick and tired of special sessions. They're sick and tired of threats of government shutdown. 
they want to move forward, and we're going to move forward. Governor, what about the – I'm just kind of wondering, and this is not a raw kind of political calculation question, but don't you think the vast majority of Minnesotans kind of view this as a plague upon both their houses and view both the legislature and you as unwilling to compromise – on your part, unwilling to compromise on taxes? What do you make of that political calculation? What do you think the risks are involved in this unallotment process? And a practical question, too. The first year, is the number that you're shooting for, is that $2.3 billion, $2.7? I think overall for the two years, Tom, it's $2.7. For the two years, it's $2.7. For $2.7, yeah, in proximate terms. You know, there's numbers bounce around a little bit depending on a number of factors. But in rough terms, it's $2.7 billion for two years. For two years. And then as to the other question that you asked, you know, this isn't my desired path. You know, this is not something we wished for or desired, but it is the situation that's been thrust upon us. And so we have a constitutional requirement to balance the budget. Minnesota statutes say that if the commissioner determines we've got a shortage, the governor and the commissioner shall do certain things. It's not optional. It's mandatory. And so I've got a duty and responsibility to do this. Do I like it? No. Do I wish it was different? Yes. But somebody's got to step in and get the situation dealt with. And we need decisions. We need leadership. The legislative process didn't yield that. This process will. Politically, do you think it's perilous for you? Well, any time you go out and reduce spending and get to balance the budget, that's going to be controversial. But, again, it's my duty. It's not something I wish I, you know, it's not the path I would have liked, but it's the path we're on. And so we've got to meet that duty. Governor, isn't this kind of an inside out thing? Is it true that this is the first time this has ever been used in this way? That is, to set a budget instead of fixing the budget at the end of a budget? I don't think that's right, Pat. Yeah, no, I don't think that's right. I think in 1986 the legislature either intentionally or negligently left a gap and Governor Perpich had to close it. Now, of course, things in proportion have grown since then because it was 40 years ago or whenever it was, but the same concept existed then. Why would any governor ever want to deal with the legislature again? Well, you have this. If a governor has this kind of power, why would any governor? Again, the only reason we find ourselves in this circumstance is because the legislature chose this path in terms of sending the bills and spending more money than we have available. They didn't have to make that choice. They chose it. Will this delay your announcement as to whether you're going to run for re-election? No. Are you going to run for re-election? I'll let you know shortly. Well, I would ask that because there are a lot of folks who say you would have never taken this path if you were running for re-election. As to all this speculation on those and related issues, anybody who is familiar with my record, I served in the legislature for 10 years. I've been governor now for 7, 17 years. And to suggest that my view on taxes is somehow now altered by some recent political speculation is being purposely ignorant of that history and my record. It hasn't changed in 17 years. So it should be no mystery that this is what I believe and I'm trying to stand for keeping a lid on taxes in Minnesota. And so there's not some recent develops and some recent motive that would account for that. It's a long time going on 20 year record. But there's a difference between taxes and dramatic spending cuts. I mean, no lawmaker or governor wants to have to say we're going to have to cut all of this spending. Tom, we haven't taken a poll nor will we on this issue, but I can tell you the number one response I get as I've been around Minnesota at least the last few days anecdotally is, thank goodness we're not having a stupid special session. Thank goodness we're not having a stupid shutdown. And thank you, Governor, for taking the bull by the horns and getting this thing dealt with. Now, is it pretty? No. But thank goodness we finally can get this thing to closure. So it seems to me the reaction from Minnesotans that I feel and encountered has been quite positive. Governor, you mentioned the mayors. I'm sorry? You mentioned the mayors and your plea for them to look at their own budget. I live in Minneapolis. This all seems to be following what is going to look like a familiar trajectory between you and Mayor Rybeck, saying we've done all the cuts we can. You know, if you live in Minneapolis, you can anticipate your property taxes going up. So I can imagine people living there saying, well, you are giving us a tax increase because of the cuts to local government aid that are going to come down the pike. Our taxes are going to go up. How would you reply to people like that? Well, some things. I don't want to pick on Minneapolis because it's a vibrant city and it's an important part of our state. But when you look at the things I mentioned earlier, let's see if they hold up. 
does Minneapolis have a rainy day reserve fund? If so, are they using it instead of threatening to lay off cops or firefighters? Number two, have they in fact or will they soon freeze the salaries of all their public employees for the next two years? If not, why not? Number three, they have an unbroken record in the city of Minneapolis except for last year of increasing property taxes every year for a long time and usually by a lot. I think the average with the exception of last year was 8% or more. And so where'd all that money go? And uh, how are they using their annual property tax increases? They seem to go up no matter what in Minneapolis. Next, are they really prioritizing? Were those uh, expensive uh, artistic water fountains really necessary? Did they need to have their own civil rights department that overlaps substantially with the Minnesota Human Rights Department? I was told the other day, we haven't confirmed this, that they have positions like directors of non-motorized transportation who will map out your bicycle route for you. Uh, is that really more important than cops and firefighters? And on down the list, they have a number of questions that I think we should ask uh, in, in, in that regard. And lastly, it's not realistic whether you're a city or anyone else who is a recipient of government money in these times to suggest that they're going to get the same amount or more. Everybody else is living on a little less. So to my mayor friends and to our other interest group friends, what cut level can they take and not complain? That's what we'd like to hear from them. Governor, if you've taken action on this, and I missed it, I apologize, but can I get some comments on the legacy bill? Have you looked at it yet? You know, we just are going through the rest of the bills here in the back room and uh, we'll hopefully have that finalized for you. So I haven't gone through that one in detail yet, but I'm about to. I think that's the next thing we're going to do. Our hope was that that bill looked a lot more like the Senate version than the House version. I'm told verbally that that happens somewhat, but not entirely. So we're going to go through that. But uh, it's an important bill and one I'm going to spend a good deal of time on. Um, I'm, as of noon, I hadn't received it yet. Well, are you going to be told? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, so yeah. yeah. If you had wait around about 15 minutes, yeah. I'll get <laughs> 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 We'll pick that up. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have enough drama around here. Your final answer on Saturday was a billion dollars in cuts on 1.7 insurance. Is that what you expect to do? I don't think the unallotment process will mirror exactly that last offer bill for a variety of reasons, but uh, in broad strokes, we're going to try to mimic the effects of the shift for school K-12 schools. Uh, other broad categories that will be part of the budget balancing solution will be, you know, the welfare, human services, social service area, higher ed to some extent. Um, state government broadly in terms of the bureaucracy, but it won't look exactly like the offer you saw Saturday night. And LGA? LGA will be part of it. Do you have any concerns that the health care cuts would affect veterans? Uh, we're trying to do all that we can to make sure that doesn't happen. And so, you know, a lot of veterans, for example, who are enrolled in one program are dual or triple eligible in other programs. So we want to make sure we do all we can to help them. Is there a follow-up to Bill Sochman's issue? Have you decided that this is going to be well, you know, Marty, we haven't got into that level of detail. I know you're anxious to hear that, but, you know, again, there's a process here. Uh, going back to the commissioner finalizing his determination about the uh, conditions existing, which he believes that does exist, but that has to be finalized. We have to consult with the LAC. We want to get with the input from stakeholders and members of the public, and then, and only then, we'll be making these kinds of final decisions. So I know you want details about what's in, what's out, but I can only talk to you broadly because the, this process has to be properly observed in proper sequence, and then we have to actually have to do the work of going through all these, you know, allotments, and that's a lot of stuff. So we got to get to the bills here in a second, so maybe a couple of questions. Well, just one more thing. I have to ask a question. So about spending, where you've got, uh, I know you're, you were concerned about city spending, county spending, and state spending. Why did you veto bill instead of signing them totaling $34 billion? Why? Why did you sign bills for such high number? Well, the uh, bills, we worked hard to get them in reasonable shape, Pat, so the bills themselves weren't all that objectionable. A lot of the mechanics of the bills are necessary and important to the priorities and functions of the state. And so if you look behind those omnibus bills, we spent a lot of time 
trying to get them in shape. And so we worked with the state government the conference committee chairs, Representative Rukavina and uh, I guess it was Phyllis Kahn, for example, and you know, try to get as much of the objectionable policy language out and get the bill otherwise in shape. So we put a lot of time and energy trying to shape those bills into acceptable form. And so a lot, there was a lot of good things in the bill that had to be balanced against the spending. So fiscally Well, in normal in normal times it would be, but these aren't normal times because they don't have that much to spend. You know, if you if these were normal times and we spent 34 billion in this biennium and we spent 34 billion in the next one and that was kind of a flat situation, you'd say that was reasonable. But in these economic times where the revenues have dropped not only to government but in the economy broadly, then it's not reasonable. I think, again, that we have to follow these procedures, uh, Tom, so I don't want to get ahead of ourselves in terms of the requirements and procedures that need to be followed, so I want to put a, make sure that's front and center on all these discussions. But in general, assuming that can all be done, we hope to have these uh, shaped up and announced uh, on or before July 1st, recognizing that would be an indication of what we're going to do with the effects not occurring until July. Sure. And we, we feel very confident about the legal footing for this process. What about as far as uh, pushing things out, just for the time that we've been involved? You know, I, I don't know about the pushing things out, but we feel very confident, very confident in our legal position on these matters. Now, I don't know that a lot of states have a process exactly like this. I don't know how instructive that would be. It's certainly a good idea, though. We'll look for that. But uh, I think each state has a little different system. Are you saying that can be that We'll be looking at it today. You know, the, if we get bills today, today doesn't count. We have three days to sign them or veto them. So that would be Friday, Saturday, Monday, believe it or not. I think Monday counts. Uh, so everything's got to be done by Monday at midnight. Uh, we, Brian indicates we did get it over at lunch hour or so. So we plan on acting that today. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know what his <laughs> options or executive powers are, but he's got a, you know, to the extent we have a headache, he's got a, a lot of trauma. So he's going to have to deal with it. Yeah, I think we'll probably try to get them cleaned up by tomorrow, Eric, so we don't have to uh, involve the Secretary of State and the legislature on Monday, although if it needs to be, we'll have to ask them to do that. But our goal would be to try to get them all done by tomorrow. Okay? Thanks. Thank you.